Welcome to Mind Body of Relationship. Yes, and today we are having a conversation with Marissa. And Marissa, you have been a student with the Counseling House for your halfway now, right? Four months. Four yeah. months. Excellent. Halfway done. Went really fast. Very <laughs> exciting. How about if you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a student at Yorkville University. I'm taking my master's in counseling psychology right now. Um, and I have a background in applied behavior analysis is what I'm coming to you with. Wow, very good. And your general client population is? Um, mainly probably 20 to 40-ish oh, is okay. what it is. Um, looking to recruit some more younger like teens would be my ideal to test out while I'm in practicum. But. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So today we're going to be talking about suicide, right? We are. Mm -hmm. That is the topic. Mm -hmm. And when you think about suicide in regards to client population, what do you think about? It can happen to any age. It's not just a young person. It's not just an elderly. It happens across the board. And I think about the fact that men are more likely to succeed in carrying out their suicide. Yeah, it seems that there is a gender difference, doesn't mm -hmm. there? Yes. When we think about men, we think about uh, being serious, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it tends that if they are going to make an attempt, it's more planned out than just a trial to see. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so for women, it, what is the gender difference there? In terms of trying? Is that what you mean? Like, yeah, yeah. hot now um i would say it's a lot more attempts a lot more attempts they um women tend to try different things such as pill intake or their wrists or things like that where they can get preventative measures to take care of it mm. men it seems to be more fatal in sense of gun use gun use uh hanging and hanging yeah yeah, yeah. So there is a difference in regards to options or choices of how it is to end life. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so say more about suicide ideation. Like, there's different variations. There is having a plan is ultimately a really high risk. Like, it's not the highest, but if you are just thinking about it and it's something you've kind of brushed across, the risk is relatively low compared to if you have a plan. If you have a plan on how you'd like to die, it gets a little bit more serious. And then it jumps up to if you have a plan where you have means, mm. you have access to a gun if that's your choice, or you could go to the hardware store and you've planned out that you're going to this hardware store and you're going to buy that rope. And then it gets to the point where you're like, nope, I have nothing. I'm going home today. And this mm. is, and that's where the severity gets a little higher. The ultimate plan. The ultimate plan of a time, place, means... The Access. follow through. Yeah, yeah. So in regards to the thought of not being here or that maybe other people would be better off if you weren't here, mm -hmm. that's quite common, isn't it? It's very common. You see it a lot, and especially it doesn't have to be that you're depressed. It can be something that's flittered across your mind, um, and it can be a relatively normal feeling. It doesn't feel like it is, but when you start talking to someone and you start hearing about it, it's actually a very common fleeting thought. It's when it becomes more invasive and more persistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is really good just to uh, know that it is quite common, somewhat normal, and it just depends upon your reaction to it for when it is that you do have that fleeting thought. Yeah. And a lot of times it's when you're seeking help or you're needing those measures. If it's just a fleeting thought where it's someone you have support, like I can come and talk to you because I know you and you're there, it can sometimes stifle that from going further. Mm -hmm. But then when you're lacking the support or connection and then it becomes a dwell and it keeps going further, it tends to progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, reaching out to somebody else, uh, having a hope box or something in your pocket that pulls you out of that place, um, paying attention to what it is that actually really keeps you here. What is that? Mm -hmm. And it's hard because in the moment, if you're at a point where you're actually contemplating, it's not just that fleeting thought, finding that something that draws you back to why you're here can be difficult. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes to the point where you're like, well, I'm looking for means 
then it's nice to have that tangible thing that you've already thought about while you were in a calm state and while you were able to work through what that means and what it is you're holding on to. Mm-hmm. And that can be really, really complicated when you're dealing with a lot, a lot of difficulties. Especially, I think, now when it is, it's multi-layered and really, really complicated. More complicated than ever before. Mm-hmm. And this is a huge... I would think trigger like the research isn't out yet obviously but you're isolated so Mm -hmm. then any of those things that have come before that are kind of like okay you walk down the hallway and somebody smiles at you and maybe that is enough that day that sparks joy you're not having it right now Mm -hmm. it's a really scary time for people that have kind of been wavering oh yes definitely i went to a training course the assist 11 suicide training course and what really stood out to me in the two days was the importance of actually asking someone. So oh. like if we're having a conversation and you're worried about someone close to you or you're worried about someone that you've met and you think suicide might be a problem or a concern, then skirting around the issue isn't the best idea. Research has shown that if you are directly saying, are you thinking of killing yourself or is suicide on your mind? Those actual words is what's getting the person to be able to talk to you. Ah, yes, mm-hmm. that's really, really important. And there's another side to that, isn't there? Because when it is that someone is actually really reaching out to you, you as an individual, you as a teenager, you as a friend, right? You at a distance. What is actually really the most important thing for you to do? Because I find what people really want to do is they want to take it on. And you want to help immediately. Uh Most people want to jump in and be like, I can solve this. This is what I can do. Yeah. But a lot of times that extra pressure of like, oh, now I've put this burden on someone is a lot. Mm -hmm. But I just need you to listen. Yeah. Just listen and be that support person and the person that checks in. Right. And when it is that it actually really is serious, what is the next step in regards to the fact that we all have a duty to report? Mm -hmm. So it's not just that your therapist or your teacher has this duty to report. If you're worried about someone... you do have to take those steps Mm -hmm. and a lot of times you're going it's hard because you're going to get fought on it sometimes Mm -hmm. and everybody does have their free choice and you're allowed to make your own decisions but it's at the point where if you know someone's going to go home and they have a plan and they have the means it's intervening and you have to be able to put it aside and realize that you by calling 911 you could ultimately be saving their lives Yes, exactly. And it's very scary, actually, you know, to call 911. Yes, and it's horrifying, (laughs) for lack of a better word. When you make that call, you're immediately asked, like, is it fire ambulance or police Mm -hmm. that you want? And in that moment, you're like, well, it's not a fire, so I know that. But it's not that she's at risk or he's at risk for the ambulance. So is it the police? But then the ambulance have the training differently than the police as well, so it's hard. And... Usually, when you call, somebody on the other end is able to sort that out for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is something that's in your mind that's scaring you again. Like you're already in this super heightened, vigilant state, and then you're getting asked a simple question of, which of these three do you need? And you're like, I I don't know. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. And it is really important just to be able to say, I have a friend or someone has texted me and they've told me this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to get the location. Mm-hmm. So technology is great in that we can text you while I'm in the middle of the forest or I can text you while I'm in the street. But if I don't know where you are when you've texted me that you have a plan, I, the police can only do so much or the person on the, end of the other end of that phone can only do so much. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it is a huge pressure to take on somebody else's distress. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I found really interesting in the research was that although there's a lot of people that are affected by suicide, for each suicide, seven to 10 more people are affected by that person carrying it out. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that whether you're the person that saved them or you've been affected by suicide, you may need help yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. Oh, yes, definitely. There are ramifications, Mm -hmm. right? Because... Um, you have to actually really think about what it is that's going to happen after. And you don't know in the moment, right? So it's another what if or what what do I do next? Mm -hmm. And you don't know where that's going. 
Exactly. So it is kind of really important to have a bigger picture, a bigger picture of life, a bigger picture of it's not just you, right? There's something that's bigger than you. And that's why a belief system is actually really important because the truth of the matter is we don't, we don't think about, well, what do we believe about death? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that can be a daunting topic in itself, right? So Uh true. When you talk about resources, when you come in and you're expressing suicidal ideation and maybe it's not the point that you're carrying out that plan, but you, you know how to like access what you want. You have a plan, um, really talking about it and letting someone know, and then you can put in those blockers. If it was that you were going to use a gun, making sure that nobody has a gun in your area. All right. Like the, an intervention. Yeah. And just if you are coming to treatment, each treatment for suicide is very individualized. So Mm -hmm. while there are groups and things that you can go to when you're experiencing the ideation, if you're at a point of a plan, it's a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, because everybody is unique and different. So you've brought a fair number of things with you today. Yes, so one of the tools in cognitive behavioral therapy that they talk about a lot is the use of a hope box. doesn't have to be a box. For this example, I've just brought, it's a file folder, took the time to decorate a little bit um, with things that bring joy and hope and reasons for living. So it can be anything, whether it's words that are inspiring or pictures of your favorite place or something that's funny that kind of sparks a little joy in the moment Um. when you open it. That was the kind of technique behind creating it Mm. and then they talk about including pictures so they can be of things that have happened or places you want to go um or little quotes you are enough just reminding yourself why you're here it can be bible verses if you're religious or if there's something that you can hold on to there it can be cute little jokes so like what do you call a blind dinosaur not sure no do you think he saw us (laughs) <laughs> do you think he saw us? <laughs> so just little things that kind of trigger you to get out of that mind step and step back. Um, they talk about letters or emails that you can hold on to, something tangible in the moment that you can reread that is reminding you why you're here. Oh, that okay. can get you past that dark moment. Right. And right. then having your actual safety plan right in with your kit is also a recommended tool. Oh, very interesting. Oh, okay. Generally speaking, suicide is is not really reported in the media. No. And a lot of times it's covered with other things. And it, yeah, in an obituary or something like that, it's often your donations can go to mental health, but it doesn't say anything about suicide either. Exactly. The words, generally speaking, suddenly, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Because the truth is there's a copycat. A phenomenon that happens in regards to suicide and so it's a, it itself is an intervention so that it keeps it off the minds of others and there's such a stigma with it I like not just the copycat effect but in the fact that oh well somebody could have done something to help this person immediately there's almost like blame passed to other people that were close to them mm-hmm. and it's not something that should be happening like often a lot of times people have stepped in, they have tried and mm-hmm. it just, it's gotten to a point where it was still carried out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it does, it makes it very, very difficult. And the truth is, is that unless it is that you're specifically asking, a lot of people hide that information and they hide it very, very well. Yeah. And like I said, if you're not directly saying, are you thinking about suicide? It's very easy to talk in circles around that topic to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, I mean, if you have anybody that you are in relationship with or dealing with that is struggling with suicidal ideation, which is the thought of suicide, it is important to reach out, get help, get support, right? And uh, it is really important to remember that we all have a duty to report right and it's a very scary thing to do that but it also is very very important and the truth of the matter is is that people are very worried how it is the other person is going to react right but we we all have to uh, take care of ourselves we all have to take care of one another and so i think it's more important to think in the bigger picture 
in order to be able to look at it in a much more positive and encouraging way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trying to reduce that stigma. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think that what's really important to have something available to you, whatever it is that that might be, no matter how deep it is that you are immersed in that sense of hopelessness, that you can direct yourself towards in order to pull yourself into the here and the now. And being able to break that cycle, right? You're mm-hmm. in a thought where you're thinking about harming yourself. It's hard to escape. So having something, like you said, tangible or being able to hold on to, to realize that you are here. It's not that you're stuck in those thoughts to snap you back. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Marissa, for thank coming you. to join us today and talking about suicide, even though it's a very difficult topic to talk about. Mm-hmm. But if you have any questions that you would like answered, please reach out, have a conversation with us. We'd be more than happy to answer them. And if you know anyone who's interested in um, counseling with our students, please reach out as well. Um, They're there for you and it's a free service. Anyway, thank you, Marissa, again. Thank you. All right, and bye for now.